Okay, um, thanks very much for sticking around. So I'm going to tell you about um, some of our work on glycosidases, um, and I'm particularly going to focus on health and disease. I'll try and make some sort of biotechy type statements as I go through, since this is a, a biotech uh, meeting. Um, so why, uh, first of all, what are glycosidases? These are enzymes uh, that exist all over nature, including in, uh, in humans and other animals. And their role is to break down um, carbohydrates, so long chains of sugars into, uh, into smaller chains of sugars. They have lots of applications and lots of importance uh, in, in human health. So I'm going to tell you about two different areas that we're working on, um, just to give you an example of the sort of thing that we're interested in. Um, these are both, um, as alluded to in the title, both related to uh, human health and disease. There are many applications and many types of glycosidases that are much more um, associated with uh, more industrial processes and some things along the lines of what Trevor was talking about before. Okay, so um, the two areas I'm going to talk about. So the first has to do with um, how, we do, how we take starch from our diet and degrade it into glucose uh, for nutrition. Why are we interested in this? Um, well, um, if we understand this process properly, I think we, we, we can understand several nutritional disorders, how they're caused, and potentially approaches to treating them. Um, and uh, as I'll try and explain a little bit later, we could even come up with ideas for um, new types of starch, new types of products that we could put into foods um, that might um, uh, be appropriate under certain circumstances. Um, and then the second area I'm going to touch on, um, Brendan and I didn't coordinate very well, so Brendan's actually given you a bit of an introduction on this already, but this is on N-glycosylation of, of glycoproteins, as Brendan mentioned before. Um, these are of interest um, uh, as potential targets for cancer therapy. And also, if you're in the biotech industry and you're making proteins, di uh, therapeutic proteins, you want to be able to control the glycosylation um, of those proteins um, as products. So understanding this pathway um, would be an important step in being able to do that. Okay, so let's start with the starch digestion. So starch is a polymer of glucose. All of these glucose chains link together um, in two different ways as these long straight chains um, and, and as these um, branched uh, chains. So there's two different linkages, two different positions on the sugar rings that are linked together. Um, we have a series of enzymes uh, produced in humans um, that we use to degrade starch into glucose. So glucose is down here. Um, so the first ones that um, starch encounters are the amylases, and these are um, uh, generally in, um, in pancreas and in saliva. So that breaks down into uh, oligosaccharides, or smaller portions. And then those are broken down into glucose monomers by um, two enzyme complexes. One of them is called MGAM, which stands for maltase glucoamylase. The other one, SI, or sucrase isomaltase. These have funny um, names um, because they actually are two enzymes. Both of them are two enzymes linked together, um, two actually related enzymes structurally um, that are linked together. So somehow there's four enzymes here, although they're two polypeptide chains, and they somehow act in a complementary way to, produce, to take um, all the varied types of starch that we take into our diet and produce glucose from them. Mm. So our, the, our main method that we use to study these um, is X-ray crystallography. So we determine um, structures of these atomic, at the atomic level, and we look at characteristics of that structure that tells us how these enzymes work. Um, so here's uh, one, of the one of those enzymes that I mentioned, so one of the MGAM uh, enzymes. And uh, we can identify the active site by a various mechanism. So in this case, it's right here where this glycerol is sitting. And so we can use this information um, along with the other structures to design inhibitors that can inhibit each of those four enzymes that I mentioned before. So thank you. So um, this is the result of about 10 years of work um, in collaboration with, uh, with Mario Pinto, a synthetic chemist at Simon Fraser University. Um, for those of you who are NSERC funded, you may recognize that name. He's, not, he's the new president of NSERC. Um, but anyway, we've been working with him, and he has made um, a whole series of different compounds based on our structures. And just to give you an example um, of what we're trying to do, so we have our four enzymes that I mentioned, and um, uh, we can uh, by using judicious uh, choices of, of inhibitor um, concentrations, we can actually control the, reg uh, the activity of each of those individually. Um, and why would we want to do that? Because the, the question that we're really interested in is why are there four enzymes? Why do they exist? And do they work in somehow in a complementary way to each other? Um, and can we control that activity um, depending on the source of starch and depending on the physical um, 
physical activity of the, of the organism. So sometimes you may want to um, produce lots of glucose in a short period of time. Sometimes you may want to have a, slower, a lower level of glucose over a longer period of time. So by um, controlling the activity of these enzymes at different levels, we hope to be able to do that. Okay, so that's the first one. So the second area, um, and you've already been introduced to this, this is a schematic similar to what you saw in Brendan's talk of the N-glycosylation pathway in eukaryotes. So this is a series of, of enzymes in the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi that are responsible for adding sugars or glycan structures, indicated by these symbols, onto proteins. So many of our proteins in our, um, in our body are glycosylated. Most of the ones on the cell surface are glycosylated. Um, so it's important to understand how this works, and this is a very useful um, uh, pathway to be able to control the glycosylation patterns to affect the antigenicity of products, biotech products. Um, it's also been shown that this pathway can be inhibited um, uh, as, as, a, as an anti-cancer target. So cancer cells, um, as Brian mentioned before, they're very much like normal cells. Um, one of the differences between them is that uh, they make lots of protein. Um, normal cells make protein too, but cancer cells um, can sometimes make protein at an accelerated rate. So if we can control uh, the production of glycoprotein in such a way that we can slow down the growth of cancer cells without um, having too, too serious an effect on normal cells, um, this would be an approach to, uh, um, to controlling cancer growth. So we've worked on several different enzymes in this pathway, and I'm not going to talk about um, both of them. In this case, I've shown you two of them here. One of them is down here. This stands for Golgi mannosidase 2, and it cleaves off two of the little green circles, which are mannose residues, um, to go from this point to this point. And so you can see that this is a key um, progression in the maturation of the glycan down here. And then the other one that we've done more recently is called alpha glucosidase 1. It's way up here at the top, and it's involved in cutting one of the little blue circles off um, in order to go from the uh, initial glycan structure and allow it to pass through the ER. So both of these are key steps. Um, which can be inhibited, um, as we're interested in inhibiting um, in the glycosylation pathway. Um, and just to show you, so this is a structure of the alpha glucosidase 1 um, uh, determined in my lab. And so again, we're interested in, in looking at the um, atomic structures of these and understanding how these work. In this case, we learned a lot about, by looking at the structure, about this, how the specificity uh, for that particular glycan is maintained. Um, it, cleaves, it turns out it cleaves a very unusual linkage uh, what's called, so called an alpha-1-2 linkage between two glucoses. And um, the, we were able to determine that the specificity arises from a very special way that the, um, uh, the active site pocket is formed to allow only that particular type of linkage to bind there. Um, so that's the type of information you get, and obviously that information is translatable into, um, potentially into developing um, specific inhibitors or other therapeutics. And I think that's all I have. Thank you.